Concerning the economically unstable times that we live in, it is a great idea to convert some of your savings into real money. Now, there is a big difference between real money and what we call money, which is actually just currency. So our dollar is currency, which fluctuates. Real money, on the other hand, like silver, for example, is a store of value over time. The best way to think of it is like this. If you had saved $1,000 in cash back in the late 60s, the late 1960s, that $1,000 would still be $1,000 technically, but it would buy you significantly less today due to inflation. Now, if you had saved that same $1,000 in silver, back in the 1960s. Today, it would be worth around $28,000. So one of the best ways to protect your purchasing power is in real money, more specifically, silver. You can buy and have the metal shipped discreetly to your door, and what most people don't know is that you can actually convert your IRA or even a 401k into physical silver, rather than having all of your life savings tied up in the paper fiat system which is subject to hyperinflation. Go to dailyrenegade.com and click on the Cornerstone Assets Metals banner. This is the only company that I personally trust with this kind of thing. Click on that and sign up to get your free silver report today. One of the financial experts will speak with you to find out the best way to protect your savings going forward in these uncertain times. Hello and welcome to The Sharpening Report. I am your host, Josh Peck. Tonight we have a very special episode for you. We are welcoming back to the show, finally, Gary Wayne, author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Humankind, and The Genesis 6 Conspiracy Part 2, How Understanding Prehistory and Giants Helps to Find End Time Prophecy. And that second book will be the topic of tonight's show. Glad to have you back, Gary. How are you doing? Doing well and uh, staying very busy and very happy to be back on your show and to you know, talk about my new book. So yeah, very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. And, um, uh, and I'm... I... I've been looking forward to this book for years, and I know a lot of people have. You put so much work <laughs> into the first one, and you know, even though it's it's a large book, it's still easy to read and understand. So it's not intimidating. Like the chapters are short enough where you, you could read two or three chapters in one sitting pretty easily. Can you give us a brief overview of this new book and how it differs from the first one? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, you know I said I would never write a sequel to the Genesis Six conspiracy. In fact, I'm 300 pages into another book. Wow! And I set that aside because of all the feedback I was getting for uh, you know from Christians who saying you know we really like the Genesis Six conspiracy, but we would like to have an author who could go really deep into the Bible and talk about similar things, but specifically targeted at Christians because, you know, as you know, most churches don't teach prehistory and they don't teach prophecy, so they're not getting the whole context. And one of the things that people really liked about the first book is they, they said, you know, it gave me a worldview that I didn't know about before or as much about as I should have, and it also made the Old Testament come, come to life. So I didn't want to be redundant, That's I, so I had no real interest in writing more what I thought might be about the same topic, but it's the audience that convinced me. So as unique as the first book is, book two is just as unique and in different ways. And whereas in the first book, I talk or I let the spurious forces or the evil forces speak for themselves. And I'm drawing from all sorts of outside sources. This is only going to draw this book only draws from sources outside the bible that really sort of supports the important aspects of the bible and so it's targeted at christians and so this book goes deeper than any other book into the bible and it goes deeper in a way that will help it won't reimagine the bible it will make sense of the bible i think in a, in a lot of ways for people so it goes uh, very very deep into everything it says about the giants the demons the hybrid races the angelic order 
the rebellious angelic order, and how all of that is explained through the Old Testament that pro provides language for understanding end time prophecy. And then I'll transition from that with all of that information and then review all of the wars of the giants in the Old Testament and make make sense out of that in a way that people haven't really seen it before. They get a glimpse of it in the first book, but not like in the second book. And then in the last half of the book, I take those terms in that context and I lay down a end time biblical chronology using that context so that people can fit prophecy into place. And it's, it's like I say, it's, it's, it's very, very unique and it's targeted at Christians and it's going to make people think whether it's from prehistory or in prophecy to maybe have another look what the Bible has to say. Fantastic, man. That's not, that sounds absolutely awesome. I want to, I want to get right into it. You open the book with uh, the days of Noah and the giants of old. What, what can you tell us about the giants and why are the days of Noah such an important time in history? Yeah, it's, it's one of those references that shows up in the signs that Jesus provides for his second coming in the end time events. So it shows up in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and uh, then you get references and details on that in Luke 17 and 21, with Luke adding the days of Lot as part of that whole allegory for understanding the end time. Now what's interesting about the word days of Noah is it's the exact same words that Jesus, not Jesus, that the Bible uses to describe in Genesis 9:29, And Noah lived 600 years before the flood and 350 years after the flood. And the days of Noah is an overarching sign. It's part of three overarching signs of the end times that Jesus provides and it immediately follows the fig tree generation. So there's a specific generation where all of those events that he discusses are going to be fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will never pass away. And the other overarching sign is the birth sorrows and how that affects the end time. So all three are that overarching context for the events described in the fig tree generation. And so when we look at the days of Lot, it talks about you know a godless nation, which was at the time of the flood. It talks about, uh, you can make an inference to people carrying on and not carrying, you know, thinking that the, the flood was coming and there's violence. And of course in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, you get the introduction of the giants as the preamble to the flood story and the context for that violence. Uh, and that we're guided to learn about the days of Noah and all of the days of Noah. And there's giants both before and after the flood. And that it is somehow connected in the allegories to what happened in uh, the time of the flood and the time of Sodom and Gomorrah that is going to be akin to what's going to happen in the end time. So that old adage that the Bible talks about in the book of Ecclesiastics where you have nothing is new under the sun, what was will be again is something that we need to understand in context of what Jesus is providing us. So it's a specific sign. And, you know, in the first book, I make a pretty good case for a technology and a society that was advanced and perhaps more advanced than what we have today that we're just catching up to to be like the days of Noah. So we need to understand everything that was going on both before the flood and immediately after the flood, and how that is going to affect us in the end times. So we have giants that show up after the flood, and they're understood as the Rephaim giants versus the Nephilim giants. So I'm going to make a distinction right out of the gate between the difference between Rephaim and Nephilim, and talk about the post-Diluvian giants, which are the Rephaim. You know, Nephilim only shows up three times in the Old Testament in, in Hebrew, and that's once in Genesis 6, 4, and two times in Numbers 13, 33. And in 13, 33, that's the embellished part of the report that the terrified spies or scouts are trying to terrify Israel for not going into the land of the giants and taking the land of the covenant. And they actually succeed, but these aren't Nephilim. Even though it says the Anak are the children of giants, and it, and it says that sort of twice, and that word goes back to Nephilim, the, the, the Anakim uh, were not Nephilim. 
and they were giants, but not Nephilim. And we know that there were Anakim in the covenant land because earlier on in the report with Joshua and Caleb, and then again repeated in Deuteronomy 1, we get that testimony that you have these three Anakim kings, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Telmai. And in Deuteronomy 2, we see a description of these giants in that period of time, like the Emim, like the Zamzuzim, like the Horim, and the Anakim are listed as giants, but that's the Hebrew word Rapha, 7495, or 7497, rooted in 7495. And so we get Raphaim used 25 times in the Old Testament versus three times. The only other time giant is used is in the book of Job, and it goes back to the Hebrew word Gibur, or Giburim, which is the word for mighty one used to describe the Nephilim in Genesis 6-4. And we get Raphaim used two times in the Old Testament, translated into English directly as the Raphaim in Genesis 14 in the War of Giants. And then in the Mighty Ten, that's talked about in Genesis 15, in the land being promised to Abraham by God. And then the other times where you have Raphaim that comes out of the Hebrew, or Rapha, Raphaim being the male plural, it's translated as giants. So the Old Testament is talking about giants in terms of Raphaim and not Nephilim. But what the Numbers 1333 passage says, describing Anakim as the Nephilim does, it tells you the veracity and the fear that the Israel had for the antediluvian existence of these giants, that they would use them to terrify uh, the Israelites, what they were going up against. So uh, this is a story in book two about the Raphaim giants, the beast empires that they're going to create, and how that's affected our history and how that's going to affect the end time. Mm. Yeah, and that's an important distinction to make between those three words, Nephilim, Gibberim, and Rephaim. And, and another uh, three words that you bring up in the book, too, that many people might not know uh, the differences here are, are demons, devils, and unclean spirits. What, what are the differences between these things? Yeah, that's interesting because you have that those three terms that are used interchangeably in the New Testament in the accounts that Jesus is describing on his encounters of what we sort of commonly understand as, as demons. And so, you know, you have like an evil spirit and an unclean spirit. You could look at that as being a demonic spirit, or you could look at that as being a fallen angelic spirit, or maybe some sort of other counterfeit spirit that's created. But because they're used in conjunction, and you have the translation in the King James Bible as devil, it gets a little bit confusing. And it's, that word devil doesn't go back to diablos in Greek as what it does when it's being applied to Satan. It goes back to daemon, the root word for demon spirit. So these are demon spirits that, that are possessing people and hurting people that Jesus is exercising. And legion would be the most famous of that. But we don't really get a significant explanation for who these demon spirits are that Jesus is dealing with that seem to be inferior spirits to fallen Nephilim or the fallen ones, fallen angelic spirits, and, and Satan Diabolos. And that when you look at the definition for Diabolos, you have Satan described as being that individual, just as as part of his name in Revelation 12 as a serpent and dragon. And he's the prince of the demons. So somewhere the demons fit into this hierarchical order, only of the spurious ones, only of the fallen ones. And these are the visible ones uh, that when we're talking about the demon spirits, at least they once were visible, that were... Uh, doing things on earth for the fallen ones. And so when we look at uh, who these demons are, they appear to be, and I make a good case for that, these are the disembodied spirits of the counterfeit spirit created by fallen angels that went into the, uh, the giant's physical body and soul of the physical world and then merged with this counterfeit spirit, just as the Bible tells us, there's three aspects to our body, and it has an oikotera in the soul, 
and the body from the physical world and then the spirit that comes from heaven and then when we sleep that spirit goes back to heaven and uh, I my understanding from all the wording in the Bible is is that spirit sleeps so that's different than soul sleep soul is an expression by polytheists of the physical world because they don't want to recognize where the true spirit comes from and so yeah these are these are beings that we need to understand what they're doing today in preparing for the end time how they're going to affect the end time but we also need to understand where they came from and how they got to be there so in the book i'm going to talk about beheading and decapitation and just as goliath was had his ta head taken after he was killed with a smooth stone that seems to be the only way to ensure the giants are going to stay dead. And in the execration texts of Egypt, the worst death a royale could have is a beheading. And there's numerous cases in secular history and within the Bible of beheadings of people because they're afraid that they may come back to life. In fact, in the time of Jesus, in the time of Herod, uh, the Tetrarch and John the Baptist, he ensures, Herod does, that John's head is taken. But you can imagine then with this understanding of what the polytheists understood about giants and disembodied spirits and them coming back, when he hears the miracles of Jesus going on in the Galilee Valley, he's terrified. He thinks it's John the Baptist. And that somehow he was able to repair himself or resurrect. And he's absolutely mortified that this could be the case. And so this beheading is something that uh, I'm going to cover off in, in a significant way so that people understand why that's part of the giant mythology and other uh, occult uh, genre. But this was a uh, an understanding that the giants had the ability to reproduce, or not reproduce, but to repair themselves. And that comes from the root word 7495. And that means to heal. And it's Rafa as well. And it is the root word for 7497 for giant. And it's also the root word for 7496, meaning evil spirit, shade, shed, demon spirit, all words like that, which are the disembodied spirits of the giants once they've been slain or their body has died. And 7495 means that there's something in a connection either as with medicine, a technology, or somehow an ability to heal. Because all of these words are reflecting the partial meaning to understanding the Rephaim giants. And the Nephilim would have been, had more gifts, I think. I think the post olivian giants are smaller and they have less gifts passed on. And so 7495 provides an insight into books like, are you still there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. You just rose up was all. So, okay. and so <laughs> that's okay. Um, and in the Ugaritic text, which is written in old Semitic, the root word, root language for Hebrew, we get the Raphaim accounts, the RPM as it would be in old Semitic, uh, Rapiu or Rapium as it's transliterated into English out of the Ugaritic text are created by the Balim after the flood. So now you're into a Ugaritic parallel story for the creation of the giants that show up in the flood after the flood. And that they're doing rituals to Baal and Ashtaroth to come back because they have an issue. They have a fertility issue. And they're doing fertility rituals to create more Rephaim. But of course they can't come back because just as their parent gods like El before the flood who created giants doing the same crimes would send them to the abyss prison or the pit prison as well. So they're no longer walking amongst humans, but they're looking in the assembly of the Balim or the assembly of the Datanu, the Tuatha De Danan, the Dadan, the tribe of Danu. They've got a, a whole bunch of different names. I cover off all of those names in, 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 in the book. At, so this is the assembly of the Datanu. And these are this is an assembly of the giants with the Raphaim are part of, just as GBR, a tribe of the GBR, which is in that 
application referring to likely a tribe of giants, or at least of mighty ones, um, are part of that assembly as well. And what's interesting about the Rapium and the Rapiu in the Ugaritic text is not only did they have the ability to heal themselves, but they could heal others. And they were the kings and they were the warriors and they were the giants. And the ability to go back between the underworld and the physical world. So as we start to relate that to what we're, we understand in the Bible, and that the Baalim um, ruled over all of the land of the covenant, including Mount Hermon and including Ugarit, uh, we get uh, this understanding coming out of Ezekiel 32 that we also cover off in the, in the book. And this is just to give how much, sort of an inkling into how much information there is on the giants. They're called the terrible ones in Ezekiel 32. And Isaiah 25, they're the branch of the terrible ones that are going to be dealt with in the end time. And the terrible ones uh, are these ones that are speaking to Pharaoh from the sides of the pit. And they're distinct from the mighty or the L, the fallen angelic ones in the pit prison. These are ones who did horrible things to humankind and were slain on the earth and now are in the sides of the abyss. And the terrible one goes back to the Hebrew word erit. And erit, or as in terrible one, the plural would be eritim. And you get all of these descriptions of like giants as strong and powerful and stout and things like that, but also childless and infertile. And not from, you know, producing seed, it's from producing females. That seems to be the issue because we don't get a lot of accounts of females and they need more females to reproduce. And that infertility is going to force them so that they don't go extinct to reproduce them with the humans where the hybrids are, are, are going to come from and all these different hybrid nations. And one example of that is Timna and Eliphaz in Genesis 36, outside the table of nations, which is really important understanding as well. And Timna is the daughter of Seir, a Horin, another kind of Raphaim giant, and listed as giants in Deuteronomy 2 as well. And so this, this term of the terrible ones, Arit, is the root word for the city of Ugarit, being the second of the compounded word. And so UG seems to be because King Og was not only king of Ashtaroth and Edrai, also mentioned in the Ugaritic text, but seems to be Og's original city as being the last of the Raphaim. And that goes back to the Hebrew word Ug, which is UWG, or OWG, sorry, and goes back to its root UWG, which is, you know, take the W out in the vowelist sort of understanding of Old Semitic, and you have the city of uh, Kiriath, which means the city is in Kiriath Arba, city of Arba, the patriarch of the Anakim, Kiriath Ug Erit, and that's city of Og, the terrible one. Uh, who ruled over the Rapiu and the Raphium at that time by the looks of things, or at least as part of that uh, whole assembly. And then after the War of Giants in Genesis 14, once most of the Raphaim tribe is uh, wiped out, I think he migrates over there because biblically he's king of Edrai and Ashtaroth of the Bashan region of Mount Hermon. And he's going to be king over the Amorites when the Israelites show up. So that gives a bit of an insight as the connections to these beings and that the word shade, these are the spirits of these disembodied spirits in the Ugaritic text and that the physical ones that are still living are actually going to parade them into the underworld and funerally, funeral processions in the Ugaritic text. Mm. And, and, and any uh, any discussion of, of giants, Nephilim, this kind of stuff, I have to ask, because uh, I've, I've always been curious about this, and there's a lot of theories uh, going around about it. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm even fully settled on, on one or another, but how, in, in your opinion, how did the giants return after the flood? Yeah, I would you'd say there's three different buckets on that. Eileen for second incursion. 
Um, I think we get um, a verse that might infer that in Genesis 6-4, but it's not a smoking gun verse. So I leave the crack open for other options. But I think a second recreation by the Balim or the offspring gods after the flood. And to understand prehistory, you have to understand there's a flood. And it doesn't matter which accounts that you're reading from, that is the dividing point. And you have parent gods like El from the Canaanite pantheon ruling before uh, the flood, just as you have Kronos and Gaia ruling before the flood in Greek mythology, and that would be in Zeus and the Olympian gods, or offspring gods that would, would rule after the flood. Ba Baal rules after the flood as the offspring or the son of El, who ruled before the flood. And it's the same account they take over and kill all the parent gods. I don't think they do. I think the parent gods went to the pit prison. And I think that's where the offspring gods go as well for the ones who commit the same crimes after the flood. And so I look at giants that are showing up after the flood as being Raphael, Raphael as we understand them. And that has, in the occult, one of the names associated with Baal. And Baal, and it's Raphael, Raphael has got several different variations. And just as Satan had multiple names, all the fallen angels have multiple names and titles. And so I think that's kind of one of the titles that passes on and likely creates a giant named Rapha, who's not listed in the Table of Nations, just as Arba is not listed in the Table of Nations, because none of the... Raphaim patriarchs are listed in the Table of Nations, which now explains why you have nine patriarchless Canaanite tribes. And I'll trace those back to Raphaim names in, in the new book as well. And so I think that is a, a better way of making sense of the Bible that you, you don't have to worry about some of the conflicts and issues and some of the words. Now, I do leave open the understanding because we don't have another identical verse after the flood for the creation of giants that giants could survive the flood. The second bucket would be somehow with the help of fallen angels. Just as God knew that God that the fallen angels were going to create the giants before the flood, he knows that he's either they're either going to recreate them after again or help some survive into the post diluvian world or both. And so that could be on an ark. It could be off the earth, it could be in the earth, and in the epic of Gilgamesh, we have the creation of Gilgamesh, sixth generation after the flood, son of Lugalbanda, king of Uruk, and the female mother goddess, Nin. And so that's a second incursion, so is Enkidu, but Upnapishtin, who, whom he goes to visit, is the Sumerian Noah in the giant survival story on another arc. All of these are classified as two-thirds God and one-third human, including the whole family of up up So you get both there. Deucalion in Greek mythology and Pyrrha, again, Deucalion being the Greek alleged Noah, he's the son of Prometheus saved on an ark. So he's another giant. These are giant survival stories and one of the possible ways that angels could have helped. The other bucket is the third bucket. Oh, and just before I pass on to that, in Genesis 6 and 7, you could make a legal argument for survival based on God was going to destroy everything he created. And the distinction there is God didn't create the giants. That's the fallen angels. So if you wanted to make that legal argument, you could do that. Um, I, I still think things fit better with a second incursion than this, but again, I'm open to that. And then somehow on the Ark, what that means is the Gnostics believe Ham was a giant, all three sons were a giant, everybody on the Ark was a giant in the different accounts. Some believe that Og, as in Jewish mysticism, was a stowaway or was hanging on the edge of the Ark um, and survived that way. Some, as in the last Noah movie, has that as Tubal Cain. Um, so... And then there's another version where it could be part of the wives' DNA that would show up after the flood and would show up into the Canaanites. 
But then again, they would have a patriarch if that was the case <laughs> for the nine patriarchless tribes. Uh, I think there's a DNA thing going on on the, on the Ark, but I think that's the wives carrying the DNA from the four races as opposed to the giants. Um, so again, I'm open to that because we don't have, again, that smoking gun verse as to how they show up. So those are the ways. Uh, my preference is second incursion fits better with what it says in the Bible and then other accounts that we have that come out of closely related to like the Ugaritic texts and all the other polytheist accounts. But we cover I cover that off mostly in the first book, but I do give some examples how it relates to second incursion in the second book. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting, and that 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 to me makes the most sense too. The second in, uh, incursion, it's it's the simplest one, you know. And a lot of times when uh, when you read through the Bible, a lot of people overcomplicate it, and when you really look at it, it's like usually usually the simple answer is most often the <laughs> the way to go. Well, and when you did, and when you dig into the Hebrew of the creation of the giants, and when the sons of God go to the daughters again, that is in like manner at a different period of time and it's incur it's inferring that there was multiple creation of giants before the flood but it also by the language would indicate after the flood but again it's just not quite there now you know i, I just did you know a show with doug hagman and he thinks it is the smoking gun and so i and we agree almost to that last sort of one percent, but I I'm a contrarian, so I need a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely understandable. I'm with you. Uh, you had mentioned uh, names and titles, uh, and this is something else that you write about in the book too. What what are the differences between Satan, Hellel, and Lucifer? Are these all one entity or different entities? How, how do you view these uh, these these names? Yeah, so they're referring to the same individual. Um, and we know, I know a lot of people, there's a lot of people have a view in Isaiah 14 that uh, Lucifer might be a Nephilim or another angel or, or something like that. I tend to put everything around what I can, what Jesus said first. And let Jesus be, you know, the defining thing on all things that we have that he, he talked about. And so in Luke 10, 18, it says that Jesus saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And it's describing what's being described in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and elsewhere. And so not only is Satan called a devil, but he's also called a serpent and a dragon in Revelation 12. So he has sort of multiple aspects to him. And in Ezekiel 28, he's described as a cherubim, an anointed cherubim that walked amongst the fiery stones. Cherubim don't do that. And uh, you have uh, seraphim that do. There are six-winged, serpent-faced angels that work as ministers that Isaiah 6 talks about. So that gives him something unique. He's cherubim and he's seraphim and archangel and probably high priest based on the seven jewels or the nine jewels that he had. And just as the Levite priests have 12 jewels just uh, so I don't leave that sort of dangling there so he has many positions titles and names and we don't know how many names the book of Enoch might suggest another name called Gadriel that Gadriel was in the Garden of Eden just as the Trubim was that means wall of God as you take that back to Hebrew even though we don't have a Hebrew manuscript that's how you build that name up um, and, or God's wall, if you wanted to, to uh, translate it that way, just as Raphael would be God heals or healer of God, depending on how you wanted to translate that. So, so in Isaiah 14, you get this uh, verse that's talking about Lucifer as the son of the morning. Uh, and in Hebrew, it's Hellel ben Shakar. And so that's H E Y L E L which typically an angel has at the end of his name an E-L, like Michael or Gabriel. And typically the Bible would translate Michael and Gabriel directly as the name and not the meaning. But somehow there's a confusion here, to, <laughs> I'll put it that way, uh, as to what, how to deal with Hale-L. And 
the King James Version translators used Lucifer, which is understood from Latin, from several different words, meaning Venus and light, and words like that, and as the morning star. Well, he's not the morning star, and that's not the translation there. Jesus is the morning star. This is Hail El Ben Shakar, Hail El Son of the Morning. Now, he may be part of the morning star order, as well as the other orders that he's in, just as you have the morning star order in Job 38 with the sons of God, celebrating at the time of creation. And I think that's, again, part of his titles, but Lucifer is a Latin word inserted for a Hebrew word into the English language, which is the god of the Freemasons. And that just makes no sense to me. And nor, neither does the Daystar translations for the other translations as well. And I think it should be translated as Hail El. And he's the god of hell. And I'll make a case etymologically that you can make a case that that's what it's referring to in part as one of his titles as, as Hell El, as the god of hell. And also we'll break down that hell is a conflated term in the Bible that adds to confusion. You have to understand it as different places. And uh, it's to me it would be better translated whether or not it is Hades or Sheol or the Lake of Fire or um, the other meanings that it has attached to it as opposed to just one conflated term. And I think it helps dismiss it as being a real place when they do that. Um, so Hallel is another name that people like to use. It is, that's the reference to the king of Babylon in Isaiah 13 and 14. H-E-L-E-L -E -L is not H-E-Y-L-E-L. -E -L. It is an allegorical derivative as it's defined. But we don't get Hallel uh, anywhere in the Bible as translated into English with, a, with that as a Hebrew word. So... When people look at Hell El as being a Nephilim type of character, I think that might be possible, but as it relates to the king of Babylon, because the king of Babylon never raised his throne to heaven. Tyrus never walked amongst the fiery stones in Ezekiel 28. So you have something called a dual prophecy here. And I, I'll talk about this in the new book as well. And it's important to understand specific passages. So a dual prophecy has distinct characteristics. It has information in prehistory. That's important to understand the Old Testament and important to understand end time prophecy. It is a prophecy as in Isaiah 13 and 14 in the period of Isaiah and in the time of the beast empire of, of, of Assyria. And that's why you have the Assyrian in there. And Assyria is basically an empire that's coming out of, Babylon is an empire that's coming out of Assyria and the king of Babylon reference as well in Isaiah. So it's a prophecy for Isaiah's time, but not all of those details were fulfilled in Isaiah's time with Assyria or Babylon. But there are details reserved for the end time. And it's those details that are incongruent with the prophet's time that we can use for an analogy of the end time. And in this case, uh, you know, Antichrist raising his throne to heaven in Daniel 8.10. And in this case, the Assyrian being killed on the mountains of Israel in Isaiah 14. And so Ezekiel 28 is a similar dual prophecy. And there's number of those dual prophecies I'll cover off in, in this new book. That's Yeah, that's really interesting. It, it's, it's amazing how the Old Testament and all this uh, historical stuff can connect with prophecy. So, something that you mentioned, uh, which is really interesting, is um, the, the, the position of high priest in the angelic orders. And, you know, this is something that came up in, in my research, too. Uh, when I was looking into the Dead Sea Scrolls and things, is that they they had an understanding that um, you, you know there there's the earthly temple and everything that happens there, but there's also the heavenly temple. But it's not just a place for God to sit and nothing happens there. You know, there's there's heavenly temple rituals as well, and there's angels in positions, and we even see that in uh, in the Bible too, like in Revelation eight, where we see some of these things um, happen. What what can you tell us about the hierarchy of angels and what what positions there there are yeah there's a sort of a standard chronology not a chronology but a hierarchy that's out there and Dionysius 
is a church father that put most of this together. And so I cover off the hierarchy in the new book. And the first thing we need to understand is that the angels are a host of heaven. And that's the Hebrew word Saba for an army of angels implying rank and order. Now, when I looked at Dionysus' model, it's not easy to understand or follow or prove biblically. And he's got several different names for the same orders. Just as in the New Testament, you get a confusion of like a dunamis and excusia being conflated into powers into English, right? So you have to sort of be able to take it back to the original Hebrew and the original Greek to get the different angels and re sort of assemble the order. And it also in Dionysus' hierarchy, you have the archangels placed in the third hierarchy uh, with uh, principalities and, and angels. And so... That doesn't make any sense to me either because archangels are around the throne. They're like part of the four groups of watchers. And Dionysus doesn't really account for who the thrones are and where they come from. And so I sort of dig into all of that. So the four watchers, uh, I put four watchers at the top and they will be over a column of, of other angels. And I put this... Uh, hierarchy in the Bible, and I walk through the different Greek words so that you can understand the different words that, let's say, dunamis or excusia are being translated from, and it can be translated in different ways into English, and it's going back to the same word, or, or arca for principalities, for example. So I begin with the uh, the, the the four watcher groups. So I, I moved the archangels up to the watcher group and they're around the angels. And I might even, I even move up a possibility that four archangels might oversee the four columns of angels in the hierarchy, just as you have four sides to the throne uh, where, where the angels will assemble themselves. So I, div I, I divide the, uh, the hierarchy up into governments, religions, armies, and thrones. Uh, and leading that would be the seraphim uh, in one, in two groups of the governments and the religions, the seraphim being the six winged fiery serpent angels that work before the altar. Uh, I also have archangels up there. And then I have the trubum and the ophanim as the same group. I'm open to the idea that the ophanim may have a separate pillar as well. Uh, but typically they're kind of used together. And if people aren't familiar with that term, Ophanim, it's in the book of Enoch as one of the four groups of watchers. And we don't get that word translated into English, but in Ezekiel 1, 3, and 10, we get the throne, uh, the chariot of God as in the vision of Ezekiel. And it's got the cherubim, and then in the book of Psalms, it's the trubum that are pulling the chariot of God, the throne of God in that, in that visual and vision context. But then you have these wheels, part of the chariot, and wheels within wheels. And within those wheels, you have a trubum-like angel, but distinct because it has a face of a trubum. We're not told which face, or maybe it's all four faces on the one face. We don't know. But it's different, but it's cherubim-like. So the wheels that are being talked about in, in, in that chariot, when it's referring to the wheel, that's the Hebrew word Gilgal, as in, you know, base camp Gilgal, where Israel had their base camp, or Gilgal Raphaim, the wheel of the giants um, at the foot of Mount Hermon. Um, but when it's referring to the angels within the wheels, the one with all of the eyes, uh, that's the Hebrew word ophan. And then you put the male plural on ophanim is where that comes from. So I have the archangels uh, overseeing the army aspect of heaven and then the trubum and the ophanim over the thrones. And then you'll have, I'll just use the English terms. So the, the seraphim and the government's, you have powers below the seraphim and then angels. The religious order there, you have the principalities under the seraphim 
and then messenger angels, archangels, you have the mighties, um, which are also uh, uh, two different types of mighties that are listed, whether it's um, um, Icarus, which are, is the revelation term for, for mighties, and then angels underneath, and then thrones and dominions. Uh, so it's the uh, cherubim and Ophanim, which are the thrones, and underneath are the dominions and the angels. And they're representing the throne rooms. And so when we now have the counterfeit army, the counterfeit host that, sit in, that Satan sits above, or the council of gods in Psalms 82, he's going to counterfeit the same hierarchy. And so they're going to rule over the 70 nations that Deuteronomy 32 talks about. And this is the same 70 nations that were counted by the sons of Adam before the flood. So Deuteronomy 2 is very similar to a dual prophecy giving us prehistory, the time of the Exodus, and then some implications as it would, as you would roll forward with Jacob inheriting the children of Israel title, Yisrael, which is a compound word for, you know, the sons of, as, as in children, Ben, Israel, Israel as being the sons of the uh, ruling God is one of the, I think, the closest uh, translations you would have, or the ruling mighty, mighty most high God, uh, as in El Elyon. Um, and I cover th cover that off in detail as well. But you have these 70 nations, plus you have this council of gods, and you have the seven wandering stars. So Satan has his own throne room on earth uh, that sits above the, the, the council of gods, and I think at Mount Hermon. And then you have the seven wandering stars who have their throne rooms. That is, I think they would have a certain number of nations under those seven stars, probably 10, making 70 nations. And then each of those nations would have their own throne room. And then as they create junior offshoots from that master nation, there would be throne rooms above that. So you can imagine multiple layers of this coming down. And just like the archangels uh, in, in, in heaven have an army and they're the ones that are going to do battle with Satan's army. There's an army leg as well that we see manifested physically on earth with the visible ones as well with rank and order. So you have physical thrones representing the invisible ones who rule this earth. You have their army. Every aspect of that ruling hierarchy and infrastructure is represented through the thrones, the governments, the armies, uh, the religions, and the courts. Mm. Man, that is so interesting. And and uh, something that you mentioned too, and, uh, you know, obviously we can't uh, cover the entire book today, which we could, because I could, I could listen to this for hours, but um, there is something that I, I have, I have to make sure I get in here because uh, I, I, I saw the, you, you have some um, sections uh, available on your website, and you have the chap the chapter list. And one of those chapters is uh, the unicorns of Mount Hermon. What are yeah. the unicorns of Mount Hermon? <laughs> <laughs> well, it all sort of fits in once you start to peel back the layers. So you have this word that unicorn that is understood in the occult as this mythical, happy little chimera type of animal that doesn't get on the ark because it's playing and uh, it's it's a big part of the occult but not just as that physical presence but something greater so the first thing to understand is unicorn derives from the hebrew word rem for a wild bull and so unicorn should not be in there um, and it's an occult mythos that's been overlaid now, you could, it could be a single horned bull, sure, but that's not the occult representation of the unicorn. And the unicorn is part of the coat of arms of the mighty Prince James. Mighty is in Gabor, Prince James, sponsor of the King James Version Bible, and his proposed uh, world empire that he and his descendants were going to build through the Stuart dynasty. So you have a unicorn and a lion that's on his coat of arms. And everything on a coat of arms is taciturn language for their genealogies, back to specific patriarchs, as in uh, Raphaim and Nephilim, and to specific 
godfathers of the celestial mafia, fallen angels. And so that's part of the imagery, and where Unicorn has been inserted, it's there to expand his mythos, so to speak. And so it's also used in relationship with Mount Hermon. And so Unicorn, in the uh, standard physical world mythos, was the horse that Nephilim and Raphaim used to, in a different format after the flood, would ride into battle. And again, it has a single horn, um, and it is this chimera type of horse. It has multiple different parts to it. So it's involving some sort of angelic technology, some sort of DNA manipulation that we're just catching up to that they had in the days of Noah. And that this unicorn horse... Um, is you know the horse that's represented on the king uh, on the on the Windsor and the Stuart and the double unicorn on the Hanover coat of arms from which the Windsor's original name was Hanover as they replaced the Stuarts. And so this is a, a, an understanding that we need to understand that if it was a chimera animal and the mythos is is that the unicorn missed going on the ark, it's because it was not pure in its DNA. It wasn't called to the ark. It wasn't playing. It was this horrible, powerful animal that could kill an elephant with its horn. It was that big. And it was huge because the giants were huge. But that's not the only meaning it has. And that single horn also is the single horn understood in the occult as the unicorn single horn of the beast empires that rises amongst the, the Ten Kings in Daniel 7 and the single horn in Daniel 8. And so this is sort of saying in their language of how they use this is that Prince James saw himself as an Antichrist type figure that was trying to create a world government, or at least through his, his bloodline descendancy and, you know, a possible bloodline for the Antichrist. But in the larger version of this unicorn, it's thought to be an angelic being. So now when we get into Greek mythology, you have like Zeus and Apollo and other gods and goddesses who have this chariot being pulled by these white horses, flying white horses. And in some of them, they're unicorns. And so this is the throne of fallen angels in the physical world, just as it's a counterfeit of what's being talked about in Ezekiel 1, 3, and 10, where the trubum are pulling the chariot. And so these in the, in the occult allegory are fallen trubum. And the unicorn single horn is the third eye, that this special knowledge is passed on from the heavenly realm to their followers. And so... When we look at how the occult tries to immerse us in everything and tries to corrupt everything, we need to understand that they have a long-term plan to deceive Christians in the end time. And we need to be aware of all of these allegories and things that they believe. And it's not, and it is what we've talked about on a couple of shows in the past, it's not whether or not I believe everything they say that's important. It's that they believe it, and it's what they're doing with that belief system that we have to be aware of. And they're the ones that are trying to bring in the New World Government, the Universal Religion, and to bring in the Antichrist. That's absolutely right. Yeah, and that's why stuff like this is so important. Well, we only covered um, the first two sections of the book, and we barely scratched the surface on those. And there are seven sections in total. So, you know, again, unfortunately, we don't have time to cover the whole book. But I do want to know, uh, wh what do you want most for people to take away from our conversation tonight? Yeah, well, what I'd like people to, to take away is to have a a hunger or a passion to a curiosity to dig deeper into the Bible. Because if indeed we're in the end time, if we're in the fig tree generation, then the size of the deceptions are going to be so great we can't imagine it. And that even the elect will be deceived 
if that were possible. And Jesus warns that it is that even the elect would accept Antichrist as the Messiah. That's how large the deception is going to be and how convincing it's going to be. And that unless Jesus stepped in, no flesh would be saved. So we have to understand this, and then we have to understand it in, in how it means for us in terms of the tr tribulations that we're going to go through. And what that means in terms of when Jesus is coming. We're only promised two things by Jesus. One, we're going to be saved from the wrath, which is the year of the Lord's wrath. And the other is that we're going to be saved from the hour of trial. And that hour of trial is that time of Antichrist rising to power. So we have to uh, put on the full armor of God, and we do that by not only having strong faith, but having enough knowledge within the Bible to take on the arguments and the deceptions that are going to be specifically targeted to break down that faith and to lead people away from God and into the hands of the globalists and the Antichrist. Amen. Well, when is the book out? Where can people get it? And how can people follow you online? Yeah, so as you mentioned, the book for the excerpts are, are out on my website at the genesis6conspiracy.com. So I have a generous excerpt of book one of all 98 chapters, and I have a generous excerpt of all uh, 84 chapters of the new book. And so people will get a good feel for it. But like the first book, even though there's a generous excerpt, it is a small piece of the information that's coming at you in this book. It's written, written in the same manner in little mini stories that lead into the next chapter that keep uh, adding information to the narrative as the book unfolds. So you can read a chapter at a time or a couple chapters and or flip around anywhere that you want to do it uh, and come back. It's uh, uh, written in that sort of way. So on my website, you can pre-order the book. It's got a release date of March the 12th. Um, it's a date that we hope we're going to beat. There's a shortage of paper out there in the, in, in the publishing industry. There's a shortage of printers and there's a shortage of labor. So publishers have to put out a date that they have to meet. If they don't, then retailers, the, particularly the very large ones, will punish that publisher. So you have to meet that date. So we're hoping to beat that date, hoping to have the printed copy available as soon as I have it. Uh, I'll be shipping the books. Uh, so you can pre-order on the website. You can pre-order through Amazon.com. You can pre-order through uh, BarnesandNoble.com right from my website. I have links over there. Kindle version isn't out yet. The digital version is already in Amazon's hands, so there will be a digital version, but they haven't released that yet either. But, uh, you know, they may release that sooner as well. So that's the easiest way to get a hold of my book, find out about my book, and to pre-order the book. And uh, so, yeah, go to the Genesis 6 Conspiracy.com. That's Genesis 6 with the number 6 Conspiracy.com. And I've done a few changes on the website as well, so it's easier to access me now. There's a place for people to contact me on the media page to click on for an interview, and then I also have a contact the author page. So if people want to get a document on some of the information that I might be talking about, like second incursion or things like that, just get a hold of me, ask by topic, and I send that out at no charge. Oh, fantastic. That's great. Um, well, we're definitely going to have to have you back on before the uh, book comes out. Uh, so keep me posted because I'd love to get more into prophecy and, and, and all that kind of stuff. That, that would be a lot of fun because I know you deal with that heavily in the book as well. Um, but unfortunately for today, we are all out of time. Gary, thank you so much for uh, joining us again. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely have to have you back on uh, sometime soon. Well, thank you. And uh, so happy to be here and hopefully... Uh... Hopefully we've raised a little bit of curiosity because that's what the book is designed to do. Yeah, I, I think so. I think people are going to be really excited about this book. And uh, and also all of you out there, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up if you like this interview. Uh, comment, share this around. Um, and when you subscribe, turn on all notifications so you know when a new episode comes out. Uh, all right. So for uh, for everybody out there, thank you so much. Love you all. Until next time, take care and God bless. Now, I've always been passionate about bringing truth to the forefront, and now more than ever, our Christian community needs a platform to discuss these pressing issues openly. Um, there's no denying that we live in a time uh, when censorship quickly has become the norm. We've, we've all seen it, you know. Voices silenced and crucial topics skirted around, uh, especially when they 
blend biblical truths with politics or current events. Um, but what if we could actually change that narrative, if not for the world, at least in our community here that we hold dear? Uh, and, and by community, I don't even mean your, your low, I mean our community here online, uh, you and me and everybody watching. So I mentioned before, I'm teaming up with my good friend, Zach Drew. Uh, many of you might remember him from the Jim Baker show. Zach's heart for the Lord and the gospel is immense, yet despite his dedication, the limitations of working within a 501c3 uh, for the Zach Drew show, it, it, it's restricted the breadth of his message. Um, biblical truths and political events are directly relevant to our faith, and we're compelled to avoid discussing these things. And th this is by other Christians. This is by Christians within the 501c3 construct. Um, that's where our vision for Daily Renegade uh, comes in. Now, Daily Renegade, it, it, it's not just another video streaming service. It's really a movement. It's a subscription-based video streaming platform combined with a vibrant social media community. So imagine being a part of a space where there is absolute freedom to discuss the Bible, politics, and current events without the looming shadow of censorship. And you get one place for everything. So you don't have to do YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, and you don't have to do all these. All of it is in one place. Um, and again, without censorship, our dream is for Daily Renegade to host shows such as The Sharpening Report, which you're watching now, uh, the Zach Drew podcast, which is going to be a new thing we'll be launching, Peck Perspective, which is an, uh, a show that I've been doing for the Paul Revere Report, but we want to switch it over, and uh, even more enlightening content in the future. So this is more than just entertainment. It's an opportunity for growth, connection, and really spiritual edification, which I think we all need. Uh, a lot more than we're able to get with our online communities. Because many of you say you can't talk about this stuff in your home church, so you have to go online or you have to go to conferences. Well, conferences can be expensive, and they're great, but they're expensive and they only happen a couple times a year. You, you know, you need something that you can go anytime you need it. Um, and that's what we're trying to make for everybody, uh, for, for, for all of you, for us. And so we can all have access to that. So one feature that we're really thrilled about is the Renegade Report. And this is this will be a continually updated newsletter that's seamlessly integrated into Daily Renegade, right into the website. Uh, plus, our envisioned community space will function like a blend of Facebook and Telegram, allowing all members to post, comment, and uh, truly connect with each other and with us. Um, also, our videos will come with downloadable PDFs that include the show notes for that episode, including content we just could not fit into the show. Um, but, you know, dreams and goals are great, and especially ones of this magnitude, but they require support. So to ensure that we offer the best experience and that this venture stands the test of time, uh, Zach and I need to raise $25,000, and this amount will cover the essential web development costs, uh, marketing, app creation. We are getting apps. We're getting phone apps for iOS and Android, and we're getting a TV app uh, for Roku. We want to develop all that. Uh, and, and vital equipment for our brand new shows. So Zach and I have been blessed with the trust of many within the Christian media company. Uh, we, we are very familiar with uh, Christian media. This is, this is our, our bread and butter. We know the space, we know the, the good in it, and we know areas that definitely need to be improved. Um, and we wanna, we wanna bring all of that in. Um, we deeply believe that, and, and also we both have years and years and years of, of trust built into that community. So we, we deeply believe that Daily Renegade is our most effective way to serve Jesus Christ and the church in this age, in these end times that we're living in right now. And th this is our chance together to reclaim our voice in a world where it's increasingly under threat. So if you feel led, um, and pray about it, but if you feel led, please support this endeavor at givesendgo.com slash dailyrenegade. And even if you cannot contribute financially, your prayers for this uh, project are invaluable. With uh, faith and unity, we can pave the way for a brighter, uncensored future in Christian media. So that link again is givesendgo.com slash dailyrenegade, and you can find it in the description of this video below. If you've tuned into my YouTube, 
uh, shows or anything Daily Renegade related or, or even just read the signs of our times, then you know that we live in a season of undeniable economic instability. It is rough. We're all feeling it. Now, while I firmly believe in the promises of the Lord, I also recognize the importance of being responsible stewards of the resources that he has blessed us with. Now, in Revelation 6, the Black Horse prophecy speaks of times when economic hardships will be absolutely rampant. And while some may see the troubling economic indicators today as only coincidence, um, they are actually potential birth pangs heralding this more significant Black Horse crisis. Now, I, I totally believe in the pre-trib rapture. And if you don't, that is totally fine. I'm so glad you're here. We love you. And, and I, I, this is something that I don't ever fight about. Um, and, uh, and people here at Daily Renegade don't fight about it either. Um, so if you're, if you're mid, pre, wrath, post, that is totally fine. We're all Christians. We all love each other. Uh, but I do believe in the pre-trib rapture. Um, but let's not forget, I, I do not use that as an excuse that we shouldn't be prepared. I'm not one of these, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get any, like, survival food or anything in case the grid goes down because, you know, my, my hope is in the Lord's promise that we're going to be out of here before then. Well, let's not forget, like, let's pump the brakes here. Let's not forget that believers, Christians, still lived through the Great Depression. No rapture saved them from those trying times. There have always been famines, and there have always been times of plenty. And that, that, there's no saying that that's going to go away. Uh, so we do need to be prepared. We are in an economic downfall right now, and we need to protect what God has blessed us with. We need to be good stewards with what we have. We need to store up for the drought, for the famine. So... Our responsibility is not only to await Christ's return, but to wisely safeguard God's provisions for ourselves and for our children and grandchildren while we are still here because we do not know when he's returning. So this brings me to a significant point about our current financial system, currency versus real money. Uh, now, while widely used, our dollar is just a currency subject to inflation and the whims of global markets. It's easily manipulated. It's not real money in the way that God-given silver is, you know, things that God gave us. Uh, so to illustrate, if you kept $1,000 in cash since the late 1960s, say you took uh, $1,000, you put it under your bed, now inflation would have eroded its purchasing power drastically. You would have $1,000 today, but you won't be able to buy as much with that $1,000 today than you could have back in 1960. Now, here's, here's the difference. If you had invested that $1,000 in silver in the 1960s during that same, that, that same period, if you said, okay, I got my, my stack of, of $100 bills here, I'm going to go buy some silver, and you put that under your bed or in a safe or wherever, today that would be worth $28,000. Amazing. So it retains the purchasing power of the time that it's in. Now, th this is the power and stability of actual assets like silver, our, our God-given uh, precious metals. God gave us this stuff for a reason. God didn't necessarily give us dollar bills, but he gave us silver. He gave, a, he gave us gold. And, you know, there's some issues. There, there's still some issues with, with gold, just with, with markets and things. Um, uh, so for, for, for me, I, I think, I mean, you can by all means go for gold, but I think uh, silver is, uh, for me, just a little bit more safe and stable. Um, not anything to do with the metal itself. It's just there's been times in the, in the past where the government has confiscated gold and it's been a whole ordeal, but there's a protection on, on silver. Um, anyway. Uh, so how can we make a wise choice in these uncertain times? Well, we, do, we can do that by converting uh, your savings, your retirement funds, 401ks, a a anything that you have saved, your assets, into silver. And there's even a discreet, a discreet way that if you want, you can get this metal shipped to your doorstep or you can have it protected in a secure facility uh, provided by the same people supplying you with the silver. And more fascinating is that many don't realize they can convert their IRAs or 401ks into physical silver and that totally avoids the pitfalls of this volatile 
fiat system that is vulnerable to hyperinflation and is getting worse by the day. Now, of all the choices available, there's really only one company that I've entrusted with, with my personal investments in this regard. And it is, it is our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a Christian-led uh, place, the Christian-led Cornerstone Asset Metals. Now, I've experienced their integrity and expertise firsthand throughout the years. And I believe that when the storms hit our economy, those of us who chose to invest in silver through our Christian brothers and sisters at Cornerstone will stand firm. They treat this as a ministry. While technically on paper, yeah, it's a business, but they treat this as a ministry. They are here for the church. They are here for you. They're here for me. They know what's coming. The economy is collapsing. It's really, we're, we're in really bad shape. And anything that you have, you would be wise to invest in something stable such as silver. So for your sake and for your family's sake, uh, I urge you to visit cornerstoneassetmetals.com. Again, I have worked with these guys for years. They are top notch. And this is why I do not uh, endorse a whole lot of things on this channel. You know, I don't, I don't take, I, I do get a lot of offers. I do get a lot of people saying, hey, will you promote this product on your show? I get that a lot. And I, I, I say no to 99% of them. Because for one thing, I need a few years to be with a company and work with them to see how they are before I'm gonna subject you guys to it. Because if I don't, you know, what if they're scammers? You know, I, I can't you know, I can't do that to you guys and, and I don't want to do it to myself, but you know, I, I feel that the Lord has put a responsibility on me towards you guys. And, um, I, I need to know at, at least as best as I can, that the people I'm suggesting or the companies that I suggest or the ministries that I suggest are trustworthy. So that's why I don't promote a whole lot of, of, uh, companies or, or even other ministries or anything like that on, on the show, you know, outside of like interviewing somebody for a book or something. But when it comes to something this heavy, I just don't do it. But with Cornerstone Asset Metals, I have been working with them for years. If there were any red flags, I firmly believe they would have come up by now. They are really good brothers and sisters in Christ. They have taken care of me uh, really well with my when I invest with them. Um, and by the way, we've even worked together so closely that if they wanted to, they could have ripped me off pretty easily. And they are just not that, <laughs> like at all. I can't say the same for every other gold and silver company out there because I don't know. This is one I can say for as absolutely sure as I can possibly be on this side of eternity. They are legit. They are absolutely the real thing and they will treat you right. Cornerstoneassetmetals.com. Click on the link in the description below this video uh, and you can request your free silver report. So there's no, um, there's, there, there, there's no, you, you don't have to promise to do anything right away. Uh, you, you know, just get a free silver report. They're not going to be pushy with you. They're going to talk with you and they're going to see like what, what, what you, what your needs are. Um, they'll, they'll help you. Um, and also please remember to tell them that Josh Peck sent you. This actually does help out a lot, uh, because it, it, it tells them who of my audience, uh, they have and where people just come in just kind of out of nowhere. They really do prefer to work with, uh, Christians because they can better, help Christians because they are Christians, you know. Um, so tell them that uh, Josh Peck from Daily Renegade sent you. If you're doing it online, there's a little space, a drop down menu that you can click on that. That does help out a lot um, because we do work closely together. And, um, and that does help me out too. So uh, their financial experts are ready to guide you and they're not pushy. I promise you, again, these are brothers in Christ. They're, they're not gonna push you or anything, but they, they are ready to guide you on the best protective measures for your savings in these turbulent times. They are truly providing a ministry effort here in these prophetic times of economic collapse. So once again, Cornerstone Asset Metals, check the link below and tell them Josh Peck sent you. Let's be wise, prepared, and above all, trust in the Lord while being responsible stewards of the treasures he has granted us.